And here's some questions and answers. Okay, Ed, should I wear glasses when I go observing? Okay, so I'll give you the conventional wisdom on this one. You can do what you like. If you have simple nearsightedness or farsightedness, take your glasses off and then just use the focuser. That's what it's designed for. But if you have astigmatism, you're probably going to need to keep your glasses on. So the problem with this is, with your glasses in the way, you may not be able to get your eye close enough to the eyepiece to find focus. The number that you're going to look for is called eye relief. That's the amount of distance that your eyeball needs to be from the top lens of the eyepiece for you to see it. And the problem is, if you have cheap eyepieces, especially as you get towards the middle and high powers, the eye relief figures tend to get very, very small. And even if you don't wear glasses, you may notice those high power cheap eyepieces are just plain uncomfortable to use. You've got to put your eye almost right up to the lens and the field of view is tiny and you're squinting a lot. So if you do need to wear glasses while you're observing, you need to get eyepieces that have long eye relief. What's the definition of long eye relief? We usually count that as being about 20 millimeters or so. It's usually enough distance for you to get your eye and the glasses between you and the eyepiece. So the Teleview was really a pioneer in this. They started with the Radian series. Those are discontinued now, but if you can find a used Radian eyepiece in the focal length that you need, consider grabbing that. More recently, they came up with the Delos series and then the D-Lights, which are smaller and less expensive versions of the Delos. But keep in mind, all Teleview eyepieces are premium products and they are, can be quite expensive. Recently, there have been less expensive alternatives that have come on the market. The Bader Hyperions come to mind. Celestron has some, as does Orion. Just check for long eye relief eyepieces. Okay, Ed, I need a telescope to look at terrestrial objects, not at the night sky. What do I do? Okay, so this is sometimes a tough question to answer. I get this from time to time, and you probably will also if you stick around in this hobby. For terrestrial viewing, you need something called a spotting scope, and it's a little bit out of the range of what we're doing here. Astronomical telescopes and spotting scopes do have some overlap, but not as much as you may think. Keep in mind, in an astronomical telescope, things can be backwards or upside down. In space, we don't care. We just live with the fact that telescopes will show different orientations. But if you're looking on land, you really need the orientation to be correct. A little bit outside the realm of what we do here. And the telescopes that do overlap tend to be either nice refractors. And I know that Questar users in particular tend to be birders or they're into wildlife photography and that sort of thing. So anyway, check out spotting scopes. A little bit out of the purview of what we're doing here. Ed, I know you showed that telescope where the guy dropped the secondary mirror onto the primary. You told him just to put it back together again. I was cleaning the corrector plate of my Schmidt Cassegrain and I put a big scratch in it. It must have been a piece of dirt in between the cloth and the corrector plate. I know you said not to worry about it, but what do you, you know, what do you do? Okay, look, let me tell you a story. I had a C8 once. I bought it from the guy who was the original owner, and he's gonna remain nameless here, but he was out very late one night with that C8, as in very late, as in he was exhausted when he got back home. Pulls into the garage, first thing he takes out is the C8, looks for something to set it on, and he puts it on top of a garbage can. A garbage can, you know, the kind with the slope top lid to it. He set it on there, he walked away, and a few seconds later, he heard that awful sound of metal and glass hitting the concrete. So this is what it did to it, and there's a crack you can see all the way from the secondary out to the edge of the telescope itself, and there's another crack on the side there. He sold it to me for a really attractive price, and I had it for a while, and you know what? That telescope's fine. I mean, I took some pictures with it, I went observing with it. You know, go ahead, don't worry about it. Okay, Ed, what is a Telrad and do I need one? Okay, back to basics here. You know, when I was growing up, we had, the life was simple. You know, we had a finder scope. It was usually a six by 30 like this. And the purpose of a finder scope is it gathers a little more light than the human eye and it magnifies a little bit so it'll get you into the general area without having to hunt around too much. Once you get into the general area with the finder scope, you can go back to the main telescope and fine tune. 
Again, six by 30 was the standard size back when I was growing up. If you didn't have this, you just kind of did without. Uh, there were rumors of people who had eight by 50s like this. Back then, only rich people had these things. But anyway, these gather more light to get a little more magnification. So a couple of decades ago, they came out with this thing called a Telrad. I think Steve Kufeld was the designer of this thing. And what this does, it's sort of the anti-finder. There are no optics in it whatsoever. There's just sort of this plate piece of plastic. You turn it on and it projects a bullseye at infinity. You can look through it like this and you can leave one eye open, you can leave two eyes open. And the idea is if you have a pair of, a set of star charts in front of you, just match what you're looking at up in the sky with what's in the star chart. If there's an object plotted right there, just aim the Telrad there and it should be in sight. So I have to admit, when these things first came out, I was kind of resistant to it because I guess I was really traditional. Finders should magnify and gather more light and this doesn't do either of those things. It's just a red dot. But you know, over time, I think I actually have grown to prefer these things. And if your telescope is large enough, you may be able to have room to do both of these on the same tube. And the idea being that this gets you into the general vicinity, you can fine tune it with a magnifying finder, and then by the time you get to the eyepiece, you have a much better chance of acquiring the object. Anyway, do you need one of these things? It's a personal call. I find that people tend to gravitate towards one or the other, but again, some people do put both on their telescopes. Ed, can you show that redneck finder again? I'm really interested in making one of those. You know, I got a lot of mail about this thing. You may have seen in some of my other videos, I had this thing I recall, I refer to as a redneck finder. It's a Rigel quick finder, and it's sort of a competitor to the Telrad here. I use these just because they're lighter. But anyway, I was buying one of these and putting them on every telescope that I owned. I would get the, one of these bases, you get an adhesive and you stick it on the tube, and I, or I would transfer them back and forth. And then I realized I'm spending a lot of money on these reflex sites, and I decided to do this instead. So in the base here, I've drilled some holes. I just took a drill and drilled a bunch of holes and then made a slot out of them. Went to Walmart and I got a piece of elastic out of the fabric session for 97 cents and I just tied it off. So. What you can do is you just stick this on here and with this you can just put it on any telescope that you like. So this is on a, right now it's adjusted for some small tubes, but if you have a bigger tube you can just undo this knot and make the elastic bigger. And in the department of interesting Craigslist ads we have this entry from Maine. Someone has taken a perfectly good C80 achromatic refractor and it looks like he has zip-tied it to the remains of a Mead Starfinder pedestal mount. He's calling this an Alt-As mount. I'm not sure how he's getting that. I guess you could pick up the whole thing and move it in azimuth mode, but I'm not quite sure how he would propose to raise the thing in elevation. It also makes me wonder what happened to the other half of both of those telescopes. The C80 had a mount at one time, and some optical tube was sitting on top of that Starfinder pedestal. And you know what? There are some crazy people in my club. It wouldn't surprise me if one of us went out and actually bought that thing. I don't even know what's happening in my own club sometimes. A few weeks ago, I was going to go see Scope Wizard at his house. I was playing with that Monolux uh, vintage reflector that you saw in another video. I was trying to get that bolt loose, and I couldn't do it. I went over to his house. I pull up, and what do I see? On the left side of the garage, I, a 20 inch obsession. I mean, he had that and never told me. And by the way, Scope Wizard has a early 80s Ford F-150 truck. That's a collectible truck, but no, it has to make room for the 20 inch obsession. And finally, some of you may have seen my video on the five telescopes I regret selling. Well, recently I got one of them back. Can you guess which one it was? Yes, it's the Takahashi FC100. You know, I concluded my review on scope reviews by saying if my house was on fire, this would be the first thing I would grab on the way out. And of course, shortly after that, I sold it. <laughs> well, anyway, the person who bought it from me, he and I reached a kind of agreement and I got it back from him just the other day. It's back. I'm happy it's here. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.